All right. Uh, I have a really varied audience here. I have, um, I have a lot to tell you about. I'm going to go very quickly. But remember, I'm going to be here for the duration. If you have any questions about anything I say later on, come and get me after the talk, because I am going to be looking at all the posters. I'm not going to go over much science. Um, I'm going to let the students do that on their posters, because I think they have some really excellent things to show you. I'm just going to give you uh, an overview of the, the program and, and how it all works. I do want to, um, really briefly though, I have to shut this down, because I want you to see a picture of how, uh, does anybody here, well, I'm not even going to say. For those of you who do not know, um, what a, a bacteriophage is, it is a virus that infects bacteria. We are covered with bacteria. There are bacteria everywhere. They are ubiquitous, right? You have bacteria all over your body, in your body. And viruses that infect bacteria are called phages or bacteriophages. And what they do is they attach to the outside of a bacterial cell. They shoot in their DNA. They replicate inside of the bacterial cell. And then they will lyse that bacterial cell. That's all you need to know for whatever else I'm going to talk about. Um, and then the students will explain more. I also think I have to say, because I'm being recorded, that my views do not necessarily reflect those of Howard Hughes Medical Institute. All right. So a little about me, because I had kind of a non-traditional path, a short history of the C, the Science Education Alliance, the program that, that uh, uh, you all are involved in here. Uh, what the big idea is for my title, how the course works, some of the accomplishments of our students and faculty in the Alliance, and a little bit about how we can use phage and why phages are interesting. So me. All right, I had kind of a non-traditional path. Um, the provost uh, alluded to a little bit of it. When I got my bachelor's degree, I didn't know what I wanted to do really. I mean, I knew I loved science, but I didn't know I could stay in a lab for my whole life. So I, I got out of school and I worked as a technician in a lab for three years and thought, yes, I absolutely can do this for the rest of my life. So then I went to graduate school. And when I got my PhD, I went to New York City to write poetry. I didn't write much poetry, but I got this absolutely wonderful job at the Children's Museum of Manhattan teaching science to little kids through a group of teenage interns. After that, the Siren Song of the Lab called me back, and I went back to do my postdoc at, at Stanford and at Rocky Mountain Labs, and I started my first faculty position at the University of Minnesota, so I came full circle. I taught at the medical school there. I did research. I had my own undergraduates. Um, had a wonderful time doing work with them, but then this opportunity came came along to work with the Science Education Alliance, and I grabbed at it. And I'm so glad I did, because I've met students and faculty like all of you all over the, the country. Now remember, this is kind of geared towards both faculty and students. So if we get to a part that, that you're not interested in, just wait two minutes. It will change, I promise. All right. So the C, the Science Education Alliance, was started by uh, Dr. Peter Bruns and Dr. Tawanda Jordan at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. It was their brainchild. And what they wanted to do was form this alliance of faculty and students all over the country communicating and collaborating on different research projects. It's a very simple idea, but it's a great idea. And I, I think I'll, I'll hopefully uh, convince you of that. Uh, the other thing was that my job, this is very much what my job was, we had to get all of the materials that would be needed to help the faculty do what they wanted to do with their students. That means uh, designing curriculum and, and sending materials and, and trying to help the faculty and the institutions who want to serve their students do so in as efficient a way as possible. So that was kind of my job, helping write the curriculum, watching the course be built. So what is the course? The phages course, it's called C phages. I can't even tell you what that means now. I mean, uh, scientists are very good at acronyms, as we all know. But um, I'll have it on a slide later. Uh, the idea behind the Science Education Alliance's first initiative, which ended up being this phages course, was that we were going to introduce students to the excitement of research early in their, their careers, as mostly as freshmen. Gotcha. Oh, yes. I, I just, yes, thank you. Early in their, uh, their careers, as, as early as possible. But it was very important that this be authentic research, not something that you do that's been done before, not a canned lab, something where you're really generating data. And it allows the faculty to say, OK, I'm teaching, but I'm also generating data and doing research. So you see how the, the plan was to help both faculty and students accomplish great science. So what we had to do was figure out what the first initiative was going to be, what the course was going to be. And it turned out to be the phages course. Because it is discovery-based, 
Um, the students are absolutely generating real data that is being used by scientists everywhere, and the protocols had to be doable. I spent most of my first year in the lab making sure that anybody at any equipment level at any university or college across this great land of ours would be able to do these experiments. That was, about, that was what I did my first year. And the uh, lead scientist for this program, the expert in uh, phage biology, is Dr. Graham Hatful from the University of Pittsburgh. And this whole course is based on something called FIRE that he did. Um, and it was a, a phage hunter's course. And uh, what we did is we expanded it on the national level and we offered it to freshmen. So you with me so far? OK. I see some nods. We're good. So what his job is is to pose a scientific question to the students every year and have the students collect data to answer that question. And he's also uh, responsible for the QC of that data. In other words, he has to make sure that that data is, in fact, vetted and publishable. It is authentic data. What we do is we um, troubleshoot all of the protocols. We've changed the, the resource guide and the laboratory manual, man, uh, manual that the students use every year to make it as easy to use as possible so that the um, faculty who is trained and has the curriculum and some of the materials can focus all of their attention on working shoulder to shoulder with the students to generate these data. OK? So I, kinda, I hope you have kind of an idea of what I did. I wrote the curriculum, helped troubleshoot the protocols. And uh, work, we all work uh, at HHMI very closely with Dr. Hatful to make sure things are going well. Now, this is for the um, educators in the audience. If any of you have seen all this stuff coming down from DC about what we have to do with our students in order to give them a really good, solid education, they're always talking about concepts and competencies. No more flashcards. We have to get students able to think about what they're doing in a way that makes them productive scientists or whatever they do um, later in their career. But the question is, how do we do this? Now, I didn't have this slide until just recently. And the reason I didn't is because I have learned this myself working with all of you over the past few years. And it, it hinges on two more C words, not SEA, but the letter C words. One is context, and the context is <coughs> phages. You're all learning great things about science by working with phages. But also incredibly important to this, equally important, is that sense of community. All right, so let me, let, me, let me back you up a little bit. You are a student in a laboratory. Does, I can talk to any of you, parents, educators. Uh, th th I saw a little baby over there, too. Um, I want you to, yeah, hi, sweetie. Um, <laughs> here's a student. Now, when you're going to college and you have to learn something and do well on a test and graduate, you're pretty much responsible for your own education. And that's the way it should be. There should be a certain amount of personal responsibility. All right? You get help from the, the professors. They, they teach you. They give you materials. They go online. They have office hours. But you are responsible for learning that material, right? A as always. But let's add another layer to that. Let's say you do like an inquiry-based lab where you go out and you collect some kind of data and you, you figure out the answer to a question working as a group. That community is you, your, your faculty member, and all of, all of your classmates. But let's make this even bigger. What if every single one of the students who are in that class are a part, an extension of that lead scientist laboratory, right? That's when it starts to get really cool. Because that lead scientist can guide you, and you can inform him, and there's a wonderful kind of synergy that happens. All of this is enclosed in the greater banner called the Science Education Alliance. And we try and keep all of those moving parts well oiled. And what I think is probably the most important part of this is the scientific community. Because the data that these students are generating make it all the way out into publications, gen bank submissions, uh, symposia, lectures, all of that posters that I want you all to look at. This is how it works. It's a huge community. It's very important for, for what we do. And um, that's, to me, one of the greatest things. There's that little phage again. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the course works for those of you who are not familiar. Um, before we go through this scheme, though, I want you to um, consider the kinds of things that these students are learning and what you have learned as students. You're getting a good basis in microbiology, microbiological techniques. They're doing microscopy, and you have to look at some of these EM pictures on these posters. Some of these students have absolutely beautiful pictures of their phages. 
Molecular biology, the students are isolating DNA, performing bioinformatics manipulations on them, which just means that they got the DNA, what does it mean? And comparative genomics, they have their little phage that they've isolated, and how does it compare with all of the other phages that are out there that have been isolated? So this is how it works. The students go in, for those of you who've done it, I salute you. But for those of you who don't know about it, the students go out and get a soil sample. Remember I said that phages infect bacteria and lysum? You mix that soil sample with bacteria and you look for lysed bacteria, which looks like a little clearing zone on a plate. Once you do that, you can do that EM. So you get a high tidal <laughs> lysate, nice pure sample of that phage. You can do electron microscopy and you can isolate DNA from that. Once that DNA is, is, is sequenced, sent off for sequencing, and you know the A's and T's and C's and G's, DNA sequence, you can then put it into software programming, which some of the students I think are going to describe to you, put it into programs, analyze that, that sequence, and um, come up with what that genome, what that DNA says about that, that organism. But again, probably one of the most important things about this is disseminating that information to the rest of the world. So what you have here for the scientists in the group, including the students, this is the phenotypic characterization. This is the genotypic characterization, right? So you're looking at what it looks like and what the, the basis in DNA fact is that makes that happen. I'll let the students describe this to you. I just wanted to reiterate that point, and that is that first semester, the students are out there isolating those phages, purifying them, and making DNA. That's what happens. Then over the holiday break, the students will go on break, and the faculty will grade finals, and the, and the, the genomes go off for sequencing. They come back finished, meaning it's, a, it's complete, there's no ambiguity, this is what the sequence looks like, and then um, the students work very hard in a computer lab now, not in a wet lab. They're not wearing lab coats anymore. They're in front of a computer and they are analyzing the, the genome of this organism. They come back and hopefully they get a GenBank submission. What that means is this is the genome. This is what it looks like. This is where the genes are. I'm going to put it onto GenBank, which is a NCBI database of all of the DNA sequence that's ever been made out there, okay? Humans, butterflies, phages, all right? It goes into GenBank and those students are authors on those GenBank submissions, right? So, the accomplishments. I don't know where I am on time, but I'm just going to keep rolling. Phages galore. We have had in this program more than 3,000 students participate at, as of the end of this year. We're only in our fourth year. You guys are part of the fourth cohort. More than 150 faculty and TAs have been trained, uh, almost 70 institutions. More than 2,000 phages have been put onto the phage database in Dr. Hatful's lab. Of 2,400, almost 2,100 belong to C students, all right? 232 of those uh, genomes that have been sequenced um, have been sequenced and uh, most of them have been finished. 97 GenBank submissions and it's rising every day because this is the time of year when all of those GenBank submissions are being um, put uh, out there onto the web for other scientists to use. So do you see what's happening here? The students are generating data on a national scale and that is being used by scientists on an international scale. So um, I'm not going to go much into this, but these letters all designate clusters. The phages that the students find are all unique. Some of them may be very closely related. Some of them may be very distantly related, but they all get put in clusters called families. And just as an aside, when I started this, we were up to cluster like F. And in four years, we're already up to, can you see M there? Okay, there's lots of phage families. These are all mycobacteria phages, one kind of bacteria. All right, and the mycobacteria phages are incredibly diverse, incredibly diverse. So we've got duck, and we've got duck, and then we have goose, okay? <laughs> Corpus Christi, you guys have annotated, has it been submitted to GenBank yet? All right, so every, huh? it's to the University of Pittsburgh. Okay, so as soon as they, they, they finish looking through it, they will send it to GenBank well, with all of you as, mm-hmm. J and J squared is another one that's going to come from Del Mar. Del Mar has two this year that are going into the database. And why is that important? Well, hopefully we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, I really want to go through this quickly because I know I'm short on time, but there's been a lot of uh, pedagogy that's come out of this. People are learning a lot about how to teach by teaching this course. 
All right. This is a publication on how peer mentoring is being used at one of our schools so that when students uh, learn this, they go back and they teach the incoming freshmen the following year. All right. The majority of the students who do this, I think I might have said this, are freshmen. Uh, another um, publication was uh, at UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. They did this only with non-majors. Who are my phage students in here? Mine. The phage students. Okay. So can you imagine doing this with people who are humanities majors? They did it. And these young people have a great appreciation for how science works, even though they're not going to be scientists. And another publication came out just recently from Cabrini College about how this can affect students' career choices and attitudes about science. The fun, I think that's fun too, but th the, some of the stuff that's fun for science uh, are the scientific publications. This is the most recent one that came out. This is about Marvin. Remember I said those phages are in different clusters or families? Marvin is so odd, he can't even, he's called a singleton because he's not in any of those other families. Right? So Marvin was discovered at Cabrini College as well. And uh, they just published that in collaboration with Dr. Hatful's laboratory. Cluster K mycobacteriophages were found at probably, I think, five institutions. And I know I'm going to forget some, but James Madison University, Washington University, St. Louis, Western Kentucky University. All are authors on this paper. All the students who found those phages are authors on the scientific paper that comes out of Dr. Hatful's lab. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is, this is one of my favorites. This is back when we only had 62 phages sequenced. See the names up there? Primarily students. These are students who found these phages and who helped in the analysis of this huge number of phages. We thought that 62 was a huge number. It's getting huger, OK, all the time. So now I'm going to put the phage students on the spot. I know who some of you are because you wore that t-shirt. All right? So I'm going to ask you to volunteer, or I'm going to pick on some poor soul who made the mistake of wearing their CT shirt today. <laughs> All right? <laughs> so I just want to ask. I, I just, just, just throw out something for me. There's no such thing as a wrong answer, because all of these ideas are good. But why would anybody, give me one reason why somebody would want to study phages? Anybody? Antibiotic resistance. There you go. OK, so phages can be used di to diagnose diseases. I'm not going to go into that. But phage therapy is a huge thing right now because antibiotic resistance is a problem. Everybody knows about antibiotics, um, resistant bugs, right? You know tuberculosis? How many people in the, in the world are infected with tuberculosis right now? How many people? Anybody? Give me a number right there. Just give me a, uh, just any number. 12? Give me a number. <laughs> a million? 200. 200. More than that. Keep going up. Million? Huh? Four million. Four million? More than that. I'm sorry, 200 million. More than that. A third of the world's population is currently infected with tuberculosis, and, the, and there has been this huge um, rise in the number of not just resistant strains, but extremely drug resistant strains and, ex and, and totally drug resistant strains. So if we don't find ways to treat these mycobacterial diseases, including tuberculosis and leprosy, we're going to go back to the days of the sanatoria where you're laying on a cot in the open air hoping that you're going to get better. That was the treatment even just 50, 60 years ago. All right? Or maybe my math is wrong. Back at the middle of the last century. Molecular tools. OK. Mycobacteria. Who knows what the cell wall of a mycobacteria looks like? Raise your hand. OK. What's on the outside of that mycobacterial cell wall? Uh, lipids. lipids. <coughs> It is not easy to get DNA into a bacterium that is covered with this gooey coat of lipids, right? We couldn't do genetics on the mycobacteria for years. But then phages were used to design molecular tools to deliver DNA into there. How? You saw that little cartoon? Now it squatted down and just put his DNA right into that cell. You can deliver DNA to mycobacterial cells using phages. Modeling evolution is another big one. With all of this diversity and all of these phages to look at, we can make some really interesting observations about how these organisms evolve. Not only do they evolve, they can transfer DNA back and forth to their host cell. So right underneath your feet, right now, well, maybe not in this room, but in the soil, there are millions of genetic exchanges going on, God, billions, trillions, gazillions, every second. So that can, that's, that's one way of looking at it. So what else do we have? 
Let's really, really stretch our imaginations. You have this organism that can kill a bacterium. What would you use it for? I will call on, no I won't. Cure the common cold? Pardon me? Cure the common cold? It's a possibility. Because I, I, it seems kind of far-fetched because the cold itself is, 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 uh, is caused by a virus. But there are things that maybe we can kind of go make end runs around. So let me give you some examples of what other ways that people use um, phages. Do you remember the anthrax letters? I'm telling you, the entire city of district of Washington, D.C. was afraid to open their mail, okay? And this led to this huge resurgence of bioterrorism research. And um, this, uh, this gentleman here, Dr. Vincent Fischetti from Rockefeller, let me go back just a little bit. When the, the phage puts its DNA into that host cell and makes copies of itself, how does it get out of the cell? It has to bust open that cell. And it does so, the bacterial cell, it does so with something called a lysin. So what Dr. Fischetti did was he isolated the lysin, and he can take this lysin and he can spray it on anthrax bacteria and anthrax spores and kill them before they can kill you. So if you imagine, uh, God forbid, an aerosol dif dispersal of, of anthrax bacillus, these bacteria, over Washington, D.C., is followed up with a jet going by dispersing the lysin agent, then you're getting an idea of how these kinds of things are being envisioned. Does that make sense? You kill the bacteria that would normally kill, kill us. And again, because of, um, of resistance. I'm not going to go a lot into agriculture. This is a really nice um, review that I came across. But think about if you had bacterial um, problems with your crops or your foodstuffs, right? You can use phage in a basically a crop dusting situation to kill bacteria that are infecting the plants or the food that we eat. All right? Pretty cool, huh? Now I'm going to really get wacky on you. I'm going to get really wacky. Just a couple more examples. I'm going to turn it over to the real scientists here. Okay. This is a real, okay, you have to follow me on this. I'm sorry, I have to do some kind of interpretive dance. Th th this is such a cool article. I don't know, have you seen this, Rob? This is such a cool article. Okay, so pretend I am an aphid with a PhD. I am an aphid, okay, and I am on a leaf, all right? <laughs> and this wasp comes along and pokes me, like stings me, and infects me with a wasp larva. Now that larva will grow inside of me and die. Yes. Are you with me so far? <laughs> I, I will die because that wasp larva grows inside of me and, and busts me open and kills me. Yeah. Remember I said that you and every other organism is covered with bacteria, right? I'm an aphid, like any other organism, covered with bacteria. Yeah. If I have a certain bacteria on me, that wasp larva will not grow. Okay? And inside of the bacteria that's on the wasp, it's like the hole in the bottom of the sea thing. So you got the aphid and you got the bacterium and you've got inside of that a little phage that's making a toxin that's killing that wasp larva. So basically what's happening is the phage is making a molecule that's helping not the bacterium but the host that it sits on. So we've known for years as microbiologists that phages can carry bad things. Right? They can carry like shiga toxin. Have you heard, you know, E. coli, bad infections, horrible sickness? Some of that is encoded um, on a bacteriophage that, uh, that carries something called shiga toxin. That makes, that's what makes you sick, not the bacteria itself, the stuff that's on the phage. So the phages can hurt us, the phages can help us. Remember, the enemy of our enemy is our friend. So this, kind of, this is all wacky, hand waving, but think of the possibilities. Biofilms. Anybody here know what a biofilm is? Anybody heard of it? Besides Dr. Shung? Yeah, tell me, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, biofilm is basically like uh, it's bacteria mm -hmm. that just grows in a thin layer across the surface. Mm -hmm. For instance, our plaque. It's a biofilm. That's right, plaque on your teeth. Very good, very good. Thank you. So. Yeah, and what happens is these bacteria that grow in this mass, it can be on any surface, even the surface of water, but if they grow in this mass, they have something called extracellular matrix. Uh, this guy right here, Jim Collins, he's actually uh, an HHMI investigator, and he found a way to take phage, put in them an enzyme that will dissolve the extracellular matrix, spray that, that, that phage onto the bacterial mass, and it will eat holes in the biofilm. 
Why are biofilms a problem? Plaque in your teeth is one thing, but what about if you get bacterial infections in catheters or in artificial hearts or shunts or any, any kind of biomedical device? Also, industrially, I don't know if you know about this, but the Alaskan oil pipeline is slowly getting smaller because of biofilms that are growing on the inside of those pipes. There's a huge industrial application for the getting rid of biofilms. Phages, all right? The last one, and this is one of my favorites, this comes out of UT Knoxville. You're worried you have listeria on your chicken? I am. <laughs> <laughs> there is a phage into which they have put a fluorescent molecule and that is specific, f and the phage is specific for listeria. It'll only infect listeria. So you have your piece of chicken, you spray it with this phage. The phage go in, they, s they start replicating, and they start producing that fluorescence. And what happens? You put a little black light on there, I'm serious. You put a little black light on there and you can see fluorescence on the chicken. It's a great way to quickly assay whether or not you have listeria infected chicken. Because they test food all the time. Food is tested all the time. And how long do you think it takes to take a little bit of that chicken and culture it and see if bacteria grow? A day. You do this, you can get it in a half an hour. All right? So I want you, I'm going to ask every single person in this audience individually as I walk through here. I'm kidding. But I would like, to, if any of you have any ideas you would like to, you know, convey to me, please. I would love to hear them. All right, I'm going to leave this up for the educators. This is kind of like if you want to design and give a research-based course at your college or university, these are the things that, in my experience, are, are the most important. And the things that I've already talked about, ownership, involvement in a community, a really good uh, lead scientist. And uh, for our students in here, thank you for not doing research that's already been done. Every single one of your phages is unique, and you are contributing substantively to the, the, the study of mycobacteria phages that's being done uh, at Dr. Hatfield's lab and elsewhere. I like to see all these collaborations bloom and grow. And my uh, email is right here. If you're interested in getting any of these articles that I alluded to or you have any questions for me beyond what we have time for today, please feel free to contact me. And I'll stop there and let the real scientists talk. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions for Dr. Barker. I know you have some burning questions. I'm going to get back to what you said about the common cold. What if we could engineer phage that could be on the normal floor on our body that would make us somehow impervious to the common cold? Right, it would make some kind of compound. Kind of like a protective layer of phage? Something like that. Well, I mean, uh, this, is, this is something that usually lends itself to existential you know, crises for most people. But you actually, sitting here right now, you have more bacterial cells in your body on a number-by-number uh, you know, number basis than you do human cells, right? You are more bacterial cells than human cells. There are bacteria all over you. And most of them do a good job of protecting us from other things. <laughs> <laughs> Eng you say English professor? Yes. Yes. As I said, existential shock. I had somebody one time just look almost suicidal when I told him that. It was very hard for him. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Uh, I uh, but wait, I've got one way back there. Could you use bacteria phage to put in like large bodies of Mm -hmm. There's no reason. There's no reason not to beyond that it should be tested very well first. I think that's an excellent idea because right now, where I where I used to live up in Minnesota in Lake Superior, if they had a bloom of of uh, of enteric bacteria like E. coli, the ones that make you sick, they would put chlorine into the water. Okay, bacteriophages are, so far as we know, incredibly innocuous. They don't attack eukaryotic cells. They're very safe to work with. We've got students, some of you guys in the phage lab have been swimming in phage. And you're fine, so far as I know. Uh, but seriously though, I mean, they're very, very innocuous. Every single test, seriously, every single test that's ever been done indicates that there's absolutely no toxicity. So that's a very good idea. Water treatment is a really good idea. Um, and they're very cheap to make. Yes, yeah. I was going to say, I know Jennifer's interested in forensics. Mm -hmm. We talk about the, you know, shortening the time span for testing and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Jennifer, do you know of anything, any technology out there where they're using that to, uh, as it applies to forensics? No, no, not yet. Oh. But, it's not mm -hmm. but I can think of things that can go on.
Yeah. Yeah, we should, we, should, we should think of some stuff and then we'll, we'll make a bazillion dollars. Because right now, <laughs> seriously, if you want to make a bazillion dollars, you, can, you have to design phages that are specific enough to where they won't um, like cause resistance in organisms, cheap enough to make, but also um, widespread enough to where you could use them in a lot of situations. But the other thing, if you want to make a bazillion dollars, is design a medical device that bacteria will not stick to. That's why it's so important to get the bacteria on the other end. You want to make a bazillion dollars? Believe me, I've tried everything, and I just can't find anything that bacteria will not stick to. I was interested in biofilms for a long time. Um, yes, sir? Okay, not necessarily talking about bacteria phages in general, mm -hmm. but more or less a virus. Mm -hmm. Would it ever be possible to make a virus that targets cancer cells? Mm. Oh my God! Right now, there are um, there are silver bullet studies going on. I mean, there's a uh, there's a bunch of them going on now, where um, there are attempts to because there are viruses in you right now. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's viruses all over your DNA. Viruses that have been inserted years ago um, in our in our in our genome. But that is a very very good idea. And I don't know if you came to that independently, but that's excellent because the silver bullet of, of of putting a virus into a cell that is going to only target cancer cells is something that's actually being researched right this very moment. I'll try and if you want to write me a, a, my email, I'll try and send you some articles about it or a review or something. Okay. If you're really if you're serious in pursuing it. Okay. Anybody else? Because I, I really want to let these these guys talk. So th thank you again, and uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and hand over to you. No, I'm not. I'm Wisdom. It's exciting. As a, as a non-science guy, uh, I'm raising, I think, two scientists, it seems, at least one of them for sure. And one of the things is, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you encourage exploration the way you have, you know, anybody from any background can get excited about these sorts of things when you start talking about the applications and so forth. Um, this program uh, has been established for that very reason. Um, you know, this is one of the events that I, I, I dressed up for you. This is Friday, and I don't have to wear a tie, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I dressed up for this. Uh, I, I say that in jest. Um, this is an event I, I look forward to because of the people that we've come to know, uh, the, 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 the quality of edu education that's taking place here. And, and, uh, and this, this takes place for both the majors and non-majors. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just an, an incredible uh, strength of our faculty. It demonstrates the strength for our institution. And you coming with your with your background and, and uh, your passion for this uh, subject is only just putting icing on the cake for us. And we want to thank you on behalf of the entire conference. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so folks, we're gonna have two students give short presentations. Molly Robertson, who recently won a second place in a presentation that was given at the American Society for Microbiology meeting, and M. Clayton Speed will follow her, and he should have won an award as well. <laughs> the, judges, the judges didn't understand what he was talking about. <laughs> and they put him in a corner. <laughs> Next to the bathroom. Next to the bathroom. <laughs> okay, so it is uh, good to see all y'all here today. It's a privilege to be able to share your research with a group of people that are able and willing to be here to listen. I know that we all worked hard on this project and it was well worth it. I think we're even going to be repeating the experiment, so obviously. Now today I want to talk to you about the isolation of bacteriophage goose as well as the DNA analysis and genomic annotation and then like Rob said, he <laughs> Clayton Speed will be taking over for the comparative analysis between other phage and goose. Uh, bacteriophage, as uh, Dr. Barker said, are viruses that infect bacteria specifically. Now, 
This is a picture, or this is a micrograph, or electron micrograph of bacteriophage goose. And this is a picture I took the day that I collected my sample, hence the name goose. <laughs> and we know bacteria are abundant on Earth. And I might find myself repeating a few things that Dr. Barker said. I apologize up front. But we have a bacterial cell. This, this, micro, this prokaryotic microorganism contains a circular genome with sophisticated defense mechanisms, which makes it extremely important when studying their predators, bacteriophage. Although bacteria are the most abundant life form on Earth, bacteriophage have numerical supremacy. There are between 10 to the power of 31 and 10 to the power of 34 bacteriophage. And the interesting part about bacteriophage that I, as well as many other researchers, find to be is that it's not the quantity of viruses out there, it's the diversity. Because no phage has ever been isolated twice, that just tells us that we can continue on to learn the relationship between bacteria and bacteriophage. Here are the typical structural components of a bacteriophage. Uh, the hollow protein head or capsid contains the genetic material in linear form, whether it be DNA or RNA or single-stranded or double-stranded. The tunnel-like tail contains the base plate, which assists in cell recognition and cell um, absorption, whereas the tail pins and tail fibers assist in attachment and penetration. V viral specificity is important because not any phage can infect any bacteria. We used a specific bacterial strain and found 26 phage, I think, from Del Mar that infected this strain. There are two different life cycles of a bacteriophage. Lytic bacteriophage replicate through the lytic life cycle, in which the bacteriophage attaches to a host bacterium. If it is susceptible between enzymatic and mechanical activities, then the genome will be inserted in linear form into the bacterial cell. It will then take over the host's machinery and cause the bacterial cell to or it will cause the bacteriophage to be able to replicate and produce virions or phage particles. And then eventually, as Dr. Barker said, it will cause the bacterial cell to burst or lyse, causing 50 to 200 phage to be released, in which they can then infect susceptible bacterium in the environment there. Now, temperate phage replicate through the lysogenic life cycle, in which the bacterial or the bacteriophage still inserts its DNA in linear form, however, it's incorporated into the host cell. So you have this circular genome that now has a piece of this phage DNA, or the phage genome, not a piece. The whole phage genome is incorporated into the bacterial cell. And it doesn't cause the bacteria to br burst or lyse immediately or necessarily ever, but it will for every successive generation that it replicates, it will have the, the bacteriophage, this viral, it's called a prophage, which is it's a non-infectious genome. However, induction, which can be spontaneous, caused by UV light or quantity of virus particles in a culture, it can cause the cell to enter through or replicate through the lytic life cycle, causing the cell to burst. So they have two different life cycles, and they're very important when studying phage because when you want to attack a bacterial or a pathogenic bacterial disease, you would want a lytic phage because you want the cell to burst. You want it dead. You want it gone. Now, lysogenic phage can be used to study like cholera. Cholera is a bacterial disease that actually isn't even triggered until a bacteriophage tells it to trigger a toxin that then causes people to have cholera and, it, and people are very ill because of that. So bacteriophage goose is a temperate phage, so you might think it, maybe it doesn't mean anything, but really it's going to assist in learning more about the prevention of bacterial 
disease. Now, to what we really did, <laughs> the first day of this experiment, we went out and collected soil samples. I went to a local park here in Corpus Christi. And after recording the following information and determining the GPS coordinates using Google Earth, we returned to the lab. And we now have the soil sample that needs to be, it needs to have like optimal growth conditions in order for the phage to replicate, in order for bacteria to be present. But we also have unwanted bacteria strains in the sample that we want to get rid of. So we seed the sample with the Mycobacterium smegmatis, which like uh, Dr. Parker said, we, it, is, it shares similar cell wall structure to the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, so it gives an insight as to how exactly maybe attachment, penetration, we could even study the genes and find out how and when this occurs. So we see the sample with the bacterium and then we want to filter sterilize to get unwanted bacteria strains out. We want just this phage right now. So we, we also wanted to it put it into, in, inoculate it into a soft medium known as top auger, which will, or we did this in tenfold serial dilutions. This will give us an idea, we will be able to visualize bacterial cell death. So this is what I got. And you, maybe comparing it to another phage, you would be able to see that the cloudiness or turbidity like of the plaques, you could assume that this might be a lysogenic or a temperate phage. So we do want to acknowledge plaque morphology because it can give us an insight as to actually what the virus can, it consists of, whether uh, like the absorption rate and the burst size. So we record the following information and then it is extremely important to make sure that we have phage, that we don't have an air bubble or other anomaly going on in the top auger. So we perform a spot test and this is what the results were. So we know that we have phage, but we want one phage. The goal is to have one phage. To, you can't send in a mixed lysate to get sequence. So we perform a streak test. Actually, three streak tests were at, in the protocol, but four were needed. We finally got one individual isolated plaque, and then came the fun part. <laughs> we were privileged to um, be able to send our image or our phage to a sequence or an imaging center where it was the University of North Texas. So we took a sample of our lysate and put it on a tiny little copper grid and stained it with urinal acetate where we then sent it off and a couple days later we received these images as well as the other students. We got a set of five to eight images per person which was really cool. Um, and what this determined was the size of the capsid. So you could see from this bar that the capsid is about 50 nanometers. And this basically correlates to the, it, it does correlate to the size of the genome that the phage contains. And the tail length corresponds to the tape measure protein, which is the largest protein in the genome. Now, after isolating the DNA out of the protein capsid using several enzymes and a, a resin, we wanted to then perform a restriction digest, which will give us a restriction map of different, or different en restriction enzymes will cut the DNA into pieces. We use gel electrophoresis to determine how far they travel and where, how many points of cleavage there actually are. So these are the enzymes that we use, which are very common restriction enzymes used today in research. We also used a, a marker to determine size. Now, we compared this restriction map to those of other known mycobacteriophages to determine maybe is this worth sequencing, is it not? We had a variety of results. Now, it can't be sequenced if it's not at least 23 KB, just 23,000 base pairs. So 
we used a common um, bacteriophage like as a marker, which is the la DNA lambda. And we could tell that it is at least 23 KB. It could be more, but we know it's at least 23 KB. So we're good to send into sequencing. And we, uh, bacteriophage goose was sent to the Pittsburgh Bacteriophage Institute, where they use the ion torrent sequencing method to sequence the phage. And the, um, they basically told us that it was a member of, it, it was a cipher verde family. So that means that it's got a long non-contractile tail, it's a double strand DNA virus, there's no more questions of whether it has a contractile tail or it's RNA. Or, and it's also one of four members of the subcluster A10. So, um, and then you could go to the mycobacteriophage database and it will, every phage that was isolated from Delmar, whether sequenced or not, will be on this database and you can pull up any information, the GC content, you could pull up just where they found it, um, and you can look at a map just like she showed. Now, we did use two different computer programs that Clayton will be discussing with you today. Um, DNA Master showed us that we had 87 genes. That's not what we received when we got our results, but that's what we as a class uh, determined after deleting and adding genes and um, using Famorator to determine gene function. We were able to, it's, Famorator is a like comparative genomic analysis of its different families of phage with similar like consecutive domains in their like consecutive nucleotides. Uh, Twister and Rebuca are Goose's closest relatives. And you can see the purple will show similar alignment. And like I said, Clayton's gonna get plenty into this for you. And that, I will let you come up. Clayton's speed will talk to you about bioinformatics and its an importance in this entire class that we've had. Um. <laughs> I'm so glad that's awesome. Awesome. You're great. Is this on? <laughs> okay, thank you, Molly. <laughs> okay, so why are we here? Why did Molly crawl around on her hands and knees in the mud in the goose park to get a soil sample to get a virus? We've got to figure out why the virus looks the way it does, acts the way it does, and we know that because of the genes. And we can get all of that information through the wonderful science of bioinformatics. Okay, so the first tool we used is a program called DNA Master. And this was pretty much to determine the location of each of the genes. And it uses two main algorithms. One is called Glimmer, and the other is a map called GenMark. So you can see the peaks and valleys on this bottom graph show the where it is probable there will be a gene. So you can see that that first line correlates to the top line, and then the second is, those are each gene. So the first one is a gene, and then the second one is a gene. Okay, the second tool we used is Femorator. This one is my favorite, because it has color and it's nice and pretty. Um, and this basically shows the similarities between the family. If these were people, you'd say that, okay, each one of these are genes, maybe a gene for hair color or eye color, and everywhere where it's purple, it shows where the family trait is similar. So wherever there's white, you know, there's a little bit of difference because you can't have it the same because then it would be the same virus. And each of these blocks represents a different gene. So as you can see, there's about 80 genes up there, so there's about 80 genes in our genome. The closest related um, viruses are Rebuca, which is still in draft at the University of Texas, El Paso, and Twister, which is done, completed, and is one of the most perfect genomes out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last tool we used is a database called HHPRED. This is going to help us assign function to each gene and is going to help us determine the three-dimensional shape of these proteins and how, so we can figure out how they interact and within the whole thing. 
Now this does use the rainbow scale. So everywhere you see red, that is 100%, 99% that there's going to be a gene and that that's going to be the assigned function. Then you get down into the greens and you definitely don't want to go with the blue. If you go with the blue, you get kicked out of the class. Um, okay, so now those are the programs. Let's get into the genes. When we first started looking at all these different programs, our numbers were thrown off. We couldn't figure it out. Why didn't our genes start with everybody else's genes? <coughs> the virus Twister, who's most similar to Goose, has a gene there. And a virus LHTSCC has a gene there. But Goose has a big blank. So it took us forever to figure this out. But once we looked at all their maps and we saw that there was potential for a gene, we checked and there was. And it's actually an endonuclease, which bacteria produce these enzymes to attack the phage. Once the phage enters its DNA into the cell, the bacteria will release endonucleases to cut up the DNA so that it can't replicate, so it can save itself. But Goose, being the sneaky virus that it is, said, I like that gene. I have to cut up the circular DNA of the bacteria, so I'm going to steal it and use, it, use this defense mechanism as an offense mechanism. So awesome. So once we did it, we went to HHPred and went, this is a three-dimensional shape. The orange is the DNA structure, and then these blue lines here and here, those are the zinc finger. That's what is going to actually start cutting on the minor groove of the DNA. The next gene that we have is called an integrase. Integrase, kind of they come in two different types, tyrosine and serine. They both are very effective at mediating the recombination of DNA. Well, what does that mean? Basically, the virus has a linear DNA sequence, and the bacteria has a circular DNA sequence. Well, apples are not oranges, so they have to use this tool of the integrase to make the linear DNA into a circular form. So we're looking at goose, and we're looking at rebuca, and we see purple, 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 perfect, everything's right. And then all of a sudden, this big white line shows up. There's 300 base pairs missing out of our virus. Why is that? It very well could have been a sequencing error when, it was, when the ion torrent sequencing method, it senses hydrogen bonds, mm -hmm. and maybe it just didn't see them. So we had this little issue. Or maybe it was a mutation. Because in the bacterial world, either you, you, you use a gene or you lose the gene. They don't want to spend the time and energy required to make a gene they don't want to use. So as much as integrase is important and as much as it is beneficial, it's not 100% necessary. There are other genes in the genome that can kind of pick up the slack. So when Goose no longer needed this gene, it literally started chopping it up and getting rid of it. Okay, as Molly said earlier, the tape measure protein um, shows pretty much how long the tail is. The longer your tape measure protein, the longer your tail. And their size directly correlates to each other. So Goose has a fairly long tail compared to its capsid. It's about 150 nanometers. And so you'd think that your tape measure protein is a little bit longer than most others, which ours is, which is very nice that our data matches up. Um, the tape measure protein, I mean, the tail assembly chaperone. This is the hardest gene in the entire genome to figure out where it is because no computer in the world can look at this sequence and give you a definite answer. Most of the time, you have like little triplicates of, of amino acids and nucleotides. And here, instead of it being ATG or GTG, it just is A, 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 over and over and over again. And every computer in the world just gets confused, and it puts one gene into two boxes. So that throws your numbers off. Um, but if you spend, you know, if you get to the lab about 6 a.m. and then you leave about 6 p.m., you can actually figure out where this gene starts and stops, and you can get the real story. So you actually can see it's one long gene and one tiny gene together where it's coding, two it's coding two genes at the same time to do one 
purpose. Well, what is the purpose of this chaperone? Well, it pieces together the major tail subunit to the minor tail proteins, and that is going to, those three proteins together will make the tail itself. And then that will use the tape measure protein as kind of the guide to how long do I make this? How many times do I keep putting these proteins on? Okay. So, conclusion. Goose is the only bacteriophage that has been sequenced, annotated, isolated, and is going to be put in the gene bank for South Texas. That's big. <laughs> we started off with 84 genes, which we knew was wrong, because it's obvious by looking that you know, you're going to have more. So we ended up determining that there was 87. They're being checked right now. And we will um, hopefully by the end of the month, end of the year, we'll have it in the gene bank. So other scientists will be able to build their research off of our research. And then, of course, Twister is our closest related virus. And since Rebuca is still in draft, I'm not comfortable in saying that is the most related. But once it comes out of draft, I'll be able to say that, yes, Twister is not the most similar. It is going to be Rebuca. As you can see, there is. Duck, duck, goose. <laughs> okay, definitely without the help of these people, none of our research would have been able to happen. And I'd definitely like to thank um, Graham Hatful and uh, Dr. Welkin Pope at the Bacteriophage Institute. And of course, our lovely teachers who were there every day in class with us, even though we didn't have class, to work and work and work to get this genome done and done correctly. <laughs> <laughs>